presentation and then 10 minutes discussion. So I will alert you, uh, I will give you a, a three minute call and a one minute call. It's a bit disturbing with the online environment. I'm sorry for that, but raising uh, stuff is, isn't really, really noticeable. So we'll just try to quickly jump in and give you a three minute and, uh, and one minute call. Um, please post your, your questions that you already have during the presentation in the chat and we will later address the questions in the 10 minutes uh, discussion. You can also uh, use the hand raise signal uh, with the reactions and we will then try to facilitate the, the discussion afterwards. Um, would be cool if you could quickly introduce yourself when you, uh, when you pose a question um, that we all know who you are and what, what your background is and where, where you come from. And uh, if possible, switch your, your videos on uh, just for a short time that we know that uh, you are here and, and who you are, but of course it's, uh, it's voluntary. Okay, so are there any questions from, from anyone? Anyone, anything to add uh, at the beginning that you would want to mention? Any special uh, needs or, or anything? No. Then, uh, Luise, uh, great to have you here. Um, handing, handing over uh, the floor, the digital floor uh, to you and uh, looking forward to your presentation. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll just start with sharing my screen. Um, so, hopefully, and then yeah, I have the first slide. Okay. And hopefully you can all see my screen now, at least my presentation. So uh, yeah, part of, uh, yeah, it will be included in the talk to present myself uh, or at least my, some of my research, my background. So the title, Exploring Study and Research Paths as a Task Design Tool uh, for Integrating Programming into Teaching of Mathematics. Uh, and then I put in a parenthesis since I write, wrote the title and developing inquiry-based teaching. So um, yeah, I, I will explain more about that later. There's also a picture of me, my email. So I'm from the university. Oh, I, I work at the University of the Faroe Islands. So for those of you who have not heard of the country before, uh, there's a map. You can see Norway and Iceland, and there's an arrow pointing to the Faroe Islands. So very small country, very isolated. Um, so I also work very much alone up here. So me, uh, my background, I have a master's degree in mathematics and then I've taken additional courses in programming and statistics. I, I've, I have my PhD from 2020 uh, in mathematics education. I researched uh, teachers practice and knowledge on implementing CAS in school algebra. Uh, kind of how to support teachers in this um, uh, adventure or journey. So now I work as an assistant professor, uh, also at this university. So my PhD is from Copenhagen University. Uh, so I work at the Department of Science and Technology and I teach different courses there and, and do my research there now. So that's sh shortly uh, about my background. Um, so uh, I, I did change my, my um, presentation a bit yesterday, uh, particularly because we're talking a lot about the journey that we do as researchers. So that's kind of what I uh, would like to project here as well as present uh, this research project. So as I finish my D PhD, so now I need to come up with new, new research ideas new research questions. So I have here uh, the problem I kind of wish to solve as a, as a teacher or lecturer at the university. So we have uh, yeah, uh, this education in science and technology and engineering and, and those students have to take some mathematics courses and they have to take it quite early in their education. Um, but that's not why they went to university to study mathematics. So um, they're not that fond of the courses. Um, the courses are often taught without the students having to implement the knowledge from 
other courses that they learn. Uh, uh, so it, it's not that it's not there. The examples are, are from programming or whatever field, but, but it's not really part of answering a problem. E even we can say, okay, we have this algorithm. It has this many steps or this, and now find out how long it takes. And, and then you, to answer the question, you still only need the mathematics to answer it. Uh, so, and then uh, the last point is that the, the mathematics courses are taught as a transition of knowledge not the construction of new knowledge, but kind of a transition. So it's kind of this uh, gas station uh, metaphor where you as a lecturer, you tell the students what, how and what they should think. You pour on the knowledge and, and then it's a transmission. So this is not my research questions, but kind of my motivation. And when we talk about this linear algebra course, I made this illustration down in the corner. Uh, so I don't always know the, your level of mathematics. So this is university level, but, but still it's in the beginning. So, so I think it's okay. So I, I say, okay, so now I, I, what I did was uh, have this, uh, you do a bit of research uh, on the internet or around articles. And I found this, these free, uh, free, um, uh, yes, strains, uh, some kind of interdisciplinary um, yeah, projects and, and how to measure interdi interdisciplinarity, whether or not it's just a question, one, one questions in programming and one question in, in mathematics, and they can actually be, be, uh, be answered without this, uh, <laughs> they're connecting the two areas. For example, what should be the recommended dose for painkillers? Um, that could be an interdisciplinary question between biology and mathematics. You need mathematics to answer the biological question and you need biology to, to develop the mathematical models, uh, model. So, yeah. Up here is a, this uh, study and research uh, tool that I'm exploring has also been used to design uh, engineering courses. Uh, for example, redesign a part of a bicycle has been uh, a problem for a course or redesign a bed frame, predict the growth of participants in an online community and so on. So there's already some research done so, uh, so this is the framework that I, I think is beneficial for my study. So it's in the research program called the Anthropological Theory of Didactic. So within that program of theory, there's a, a framework called Study and Research Path. And, and for this, uh, if you don't uh, say it out too loud, uh, we can call it a type of inquiry-based teaching. Uh, it has some more different aspects than inquiry-based teaching, but, but it's okay to say it right now. So it's called study and research path. So it's kind of a, a dialectic uh, um, dynamic here between studying and research. So first you, you start with a generating question. Uh, so what should be the dose uh, uh, for painkillers? So there's a knowledge, so there's some knowledge about this. So you go out and study the knowledge already established, and then uh, you, you uh, reconstruct that knowledge to fit into your settings. So first of all, what type of painkillers are there? Uh, should be another question. Uh, so this is an kind mm -hmm. of uh, an illustration here uh, of questions you ask in this process or a path that you can do. You, uh, you get a generating question, a generating questions kind of ignites more questions. It's, it's, uh, it's not an easy, it's not a yes or no question. It's not an, a question with the answer for. It's, it's more complicated than that. And in order to, to answer uh, this generating question, you should ask more questions. Uh, so this is how it can illustrate it. And uh, 
the questions are all sometimes connected. So when we get an answer from one question, uh, this can lead uh, to an answer in another question. And that is also how we can kind of measure this interdisciplinarity because uh, an, a question and an answer in one discipline is being used uh, in another question in the other discipline. So uh, the idea is to, to take uh, what they know in programming and is used inside uh, the mathematics courses. So uh, yeah, this is, uh, you could call it visiting uh, or questioning the world, the paradigm, paradigm of question, questioning the world in, instead of having, now you should uh, learn about vector spaces because we will use that later on. Instead, I will give them questions. So they need to go out and study this theory of vector spaces and then reconstruct that knowledge. So. Louisa, you have yeah. uh, one minute left. Okay, that's good because this is my idea for for some of the questions asked. So um, one of the first SRP here would what could a function look like that transform plain text to italic? So it moves something that is standing straight up, and then it it has a small transformation sideways here. Uh, so this is very mathematically constructed, but so this is what I expect them to develop. And sometimes midway you have a 3 day linear transformation. So what could a function look like that moves a 3D object in a flight simulator? So you need you know that it's when the closer it moves, the bigger it gets. Um, so that would, would be the idea. Um, so, uh, and now I start to be able to formulate my research questions. Uh, what are the conditions for these SAP based courses? What are the constraints? How to manage and evaluate students' progress in SAPs? And something about having smaller SAPs inside of bigger SAPs, um, and then et cetera, et cetera. So now comes my more specific research questions. Uh, and then uh, actually next week we have a seminar um, um, in Copenhagen University by, by some of the founders of this uh, research program, just if you're interested. Um, so <laughs> that was my presentation. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Louisa. It was uh, really, really interesting. and. Uh... Uh, I jotted down some some notes because uh, I think it's a it's an interesting topic and uh, I'm really curious of uh, uh, because I, as I'm not from this field it's uh, for me not not easy to imagine how it is actually carried out in 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 practice but probably that's because I'm not from this uh, from this area so uh, are there any questions from uh, from the other participants uh, to uh, Louise about any details that you would want to to uh, to get in depth of her presentation, anything that you would want to, to know additionally? Please just uh, raise your hand uh, if, you, if you have any questions. So uh, you can still think about your questions uh, while I pose mine. <laughs> so Louise, that was just my, my questions when I, uh, when you said that, uh, that it is within the anthropological theory of, of didactics, um, that it that your your research area is in, within this this larger research area. So how how does it trace back in in history this this type of uh, of inquiry that that you are doing um, the, the study and and the research paths? What is what are the the historical roots of of this concept? Can you yeah. Do a bit in detail of this? Yeah, yeah, I can I can say a bit about it. So so this is something new that I picked up. So I don't know too. I'm I wouldn't say I'm an expert on it yet, but I I've studied and um so this anthropological theory of didactic was developed in, in France and uh to to guide and support uh, teachers in, in developing and, and in teacher education by Yves Chevalier and it it's, it's a big theory program um, 
And in that are kind of models and notions. And, and one of these are SRPs, the study and research paths. And, and um, I think one of the uh, more serious works that was done was actually a PhD study done in Copenhagen. And she finished, I think, five years ago where she used it in high schools. First, uh, first as she was a teacher, so she did it in everyday teaching. Every mathematics le lesson was a small SRP. And then she also did it to analyze uh, these interdisciplinary projects. And also as a de uh, design tool to post these interdisciplinary uh, uh, projects, um, or at least questions to answer for students to do these projects. Then it has uh, developed quite rapidly um, and, and they, they start to say, no, it's not really inquiry because the students are allowed to, to go out and study. Uh, so sometimes when you have inquiry-based teaching, we are inside the classroom and we don't go outside. Uh, we don't use the internet and Google everything. So one of the points is that, that you can actually go out and, and Google whatever you like. Um, and, and, but also you can ask your teacher questions. So uh, you, you, had, you can study what your teacher knows. So uh, and one of the things when, I, if or when I have to try this, which is gonna be scary is that I don't know the answer to, to these uh, open uh, questions. And I, I cannot get there on my own. I, I need the students there as well. Um, so of, and um, what we already know from these experiences is that they are very open and, and we need to have some kind of workshops, uh, workshop sessions so the students can share what, how far they have reached and get ideas from, from other uh, so that they, they don't so that they get a rich, this, uh, they, they, so they are, yeah, so they get a rich study and research uh, experience. So is it a bit like a, a guided discovery learning where you guide them in the process or where they just, or is the difference more that they can, that it's not a pure discovery learning, but that this, it's this combination with the studying that you mentioned? Yeah, it, it's more, uh, I think the idea is that the teachers should not be very active in the process. The, the teachers is not a, a guide, but is there a, as a media for the students to consult. Uh, but that the students are in one of the engineering courses, um, in order for the students to realize how much they are learning, they had this question map. So every time they post a question, they should write it in a question map. And every week they should write down what they what they had done. Because for some students, it's 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 very a, a big change in the didactical contract. Uh, what they are supposed to learn and what they are suddenly learning, it's, it's um, it is confusing for them because it's it's a big change. Um, so, uh, okay. but but uh, what I, I have seen in the literature is, is very impressive um, what, mm -hmm. what the students can do. So, yeah, yeah. It looks, it looks interesting. Um, um, are, there, are there any other questions from, uh, from the floor, more or less? Anything that you would want to ask Louise about her research? Nothing yet. Okay, Susanne, would you be uh, ready for yours? Sure, I can start. Sure, then I just wanted to say uh, thanks again to Luise. I think it was really, uh, really interesting for me to, to get to know your research topic and I, yeah, I will for sure follow, follow up your, your research um, and, and see how it develops. And yeah, next is uh, Susanne. She's talking about problems that can arise when using GeoGebra at Austrian high schools. And yeah, the floor is yours, uh, Susanne. Thank you. So hello and welcome to my presentation. Um, first about me, I am Susanne Treiner. I'm from Upper Austria. And I'm now a PhD student at the JKU in Linz. 
I'm in my second semester right now. And before starting my PhD, I studied mathematics and chemistry as a teacher. And so I started the PhD right after my um, teacher studying. So I started in October 2020 and just finished my diploma before. Today, I want to present you the idea of what I want to write about in my PhD. In general, I want to focus on the use of GeoGebra in mathematics classes at high schools in Austria. The main goal of my thesis will be to identify problems that might arise when GeoGebra is used at school. Because in my experience, there are still some teachers who barely deal with the use of GeoGebra and only use it rarely or not at all in class. As a result, many students are overwhelmed by using GeoGebra instead of seeing it as a help. And I would like to help the teachers to get more information about the use of GeoGebra um, so that they are better acquainted with it and then can better support the students in case of difficulties. In my PhD, I'm going to fo focus especially on the students here. And I want to find out how familiar they are with the use of GeoGebra and what kind of difficulties they might have. I either want to find out if teachers know the difficulties which arise for pupils and if the teachers can help them solving the problems. In the first step, I'm going to, and partially already did, make a mind map about problems and difficulties that could arise in my opinion when GeoGebra is used in mathematics classes. Therefore, I will think about problems I had when I first used GeoGebra, or either difficulties friends told me about they had, or teachers um, who already experienced some difficulties when using it with their pupils at school. I will either search on the internet if I can find suitable information, and following are a few difficulties that might arise and I already came up with. First is technical problems. In this category, I'm thinking about very general problems, um, like where can GeoGebra be downloaded or how to use GeoGebra online. Some students might still either have the problem that they do not own a computer or don't really know how to use it on their smartphones. The next problem that might arise are mathematical problems. Um, these are not really problems that arise when using GeoGebra, but I think they either fit in here because some students might not understand the exercise and then don't know how to, what to calculate and then have difficulties with using GeoGebra. Next is the problems in using GeoGebra. So after the pupils understood what they have to do in their exercises, they probably might not always know how to answer the problem in GeoGebra and where they should enter it. Another problem could be that they simply don't know which applet should be used. After they have already answered all the questions they had before, GeoGebra might not be calculating what they wanted or they did not enter enough information or did use the wrong command. So GeoGebra is not calculating anything or um, GeoGebra just didn't calculate what people expected. And I either think about error messages. Another very annoy annoying moment is when GeoGebra is just bringing an error message and you do not really know why. Of course, there are many more problems, but these are those I came up with until now. I would like to find out if these problems, or at least some of them, really arise at school, or are these just problems I think they could arise, and what other difficulties could be seen. My next step will be to interview a few teachers um, who are already using GeoGebra in their mathematics classes. And I want to talk to teachers about the following topics. First, I want to know for which topics are they using GeoGebra. In this question, I want to find out if they answer everything in GeoGebra 
or if they still used paper and pencil for solving mathematical issues. It would either be interesting which GeoGebra applets they're using, if they use different applets, or if they just use one GeoGebra applet and enter everything. With this question, I can either investigate how many different ways of using GeoGebra are already known by the teachers. The next question will be, do they sometimes have difficulties when using GeoGebra? And what kind of difficulties arise for teachers? For me, it is interesting if the teachers have troubles when using GeoGebra, or if the teachers are already very familiar with the use. After knowing more about the problems teachers have, they should talk about the students. So do they think that students are already very familiar with the use of GeoGebra? And if they don't think so, where might students have problems? Together with the question before, I can't find out if teachers think that students have the same troubles than they have, or if they think that the difficulties lie somewhere else. It is also interesting if the, if the students talk about their problems so that the teachers can help them, or if the teachers can only assume which problems arise for pupils. And who is solving these problems? This question is either interesting for solving the problems from the teachers and those from the pupils. Data shows who is more familiar with the usage, the teachers or the pupils. And it will be interesting who can solve the problems and where to find um, solutions for their difficulties. And my last question will be, where do or did the teachers get the necessary information to be able to use GeoGebra at school? I know that a lot of information can, okay. I know that a lot of information can be found on the internet, but I'm curious if the teachers either know this and I want to know if the teachers just tried out in their commuters, if they first search on the internet how to use it, or they may even ask colleagues for help. Some teachers, especially the younger ones, might even have learned the usage of GeoGebra at their time at school or at university. But especially older teachers have to find another way of how to learn the usage. After these interviews, I hope that I can already better imagine how the use of GeoGebra in mathematics classes at Austrian high schools looks like. I either hope that with this information, I can make two questionnaires. One questionnaire should be for teachers and one for pupils. With these questionnaires, I want to be able to ask more people about the GeoGebra usage. And in the end, I want to find out if the teacher's opinion about the students' problems about with with the use of GeoGebra, are the real problems from the pupils or if they differ? So in the next step, I'm going to make questionnaires and spread them to teachers from all over Austria. And in these questionnaires, the questions will remain very similar to the questions I posed to the teachers before in the interviews. But now I want to know more about both sides, so on the teachers and on the pupil side. Therefore, I will ask one mathematics teacher to fill out the questionnaires for teachers and about two classes in which he or she is teaching. After receiving several answers, I will have to evaluate the questionnaires and in the end, I hopefully know more about the use of GeoGebra at school and especially about difficulties that might arise for students. Susanna, you have one minute left. Yeah, I'm nearly ready. So that's good. So I hope that I have been able to introduce my plan of my PhD to you. And I would be happy to have a few comments. And thank you for listening. Thank you, Susanna. So, um, are there any questions from uh, from the floor to Susanna about her planned research? Uh, any inputs that you would want to to give, uh, Louise? Please. Yeah, yeah, I have a question. So uh, for me, it's, if I should just generalize, it, it sounds like you will you are looking for the constraints and conditions for uh, having implementing GeoGebra in in the classroom. 
by asking the teachers and students their opinions. Do you plan, how do you plan on um, kind of uh, categorizing these conditions and constraints that they will point at? Um, so I will first um, interview the teachers so that they can already give me some ideas of what kind of problems and then I will see how to bring several problems together to one bigger problem and then see which of these problems really arise for the pupils. Is this what you mean? Yeah. Yeah, but also, do you have a theory or framework that you you are planning to use? Or? Uh, I'm not that much in my PhD right now, so right now not, but I will definitely look for that. Yeah, I, I don't know if it's also, it's also about tradition in different countries, so I'm not, I'm not your PhD advisor, so I, I don't know <laughs> what the plan is. And so. But no, yeah, okay. Yeah, I don't know if I will introduce or if I will either look about other countries. So right now I'm just planning to look on Austrian schools so that I will have just a smaller range of answers. Okay. Do, do you know of uh, Linda Ball, uh, her work? Uh, so it's not just about uh, GeoGebra, but she talked a lot about teachers implementing uh, these computer algebra systems in, in high school in Australia, I think. Yeah, that sounds interesting. No, I didn't know her. Okay, yeah. She's, she has done some good work. I, I used her work a lot. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Good. Any other questions from the from the floor to Susanne? Um, Louise may I follow up on, on your question? So you asked for the theoretical framework or did you ask for the research framework on, on how to analyze the, the data of the interviews? Well, I was, uh, yep, yeah, um, I, I mean, it, it's not the methodology for, for how to analyze it, but so let's see, um, it, so let's see, um, you get some, a lot of answers about, um, uh, I cannot always get the projector to work or this, the smart board and the students don't always bring their computers to school or uh, I'm just so uncertain about the program. I don't have a background in, in uh, with computers and others says, ah, the, the exercises it's not good or someone else says, ah, I can't see the screen always when the students are working or, so if this is your feedback, then how will you group them together and, and yeah. Okay, yeah. So for a theoretical framework of, uh, of how to, to group the, the data and how to code it. Yeah, okay. or just name some of the categories or something, yeah. Okay. So. So that was that was uh, about my my question as well. Whether if there are existing frameworks on what the standard problems of the the use of uh, of programs like GeoGebra are, or did GeoGebra already do any any research about these issues? Do they have any feedback data on the uh, that the, they directly get on the GeoGebra platform about the troubles that students or or teachers have? Is there a feedback function in GeoGebra? Um, not really. So they know, of course, a few problems in there when they get feedback on the support, but there is no feedback like that now. Okay, so it's more tailored to the to the applet itself, so to technical issues, but not to the use. Uh, how uh, so? So what the, the the problems in user? Okay. Um, yeah. So uh, and and is are you doing this in in conjunction with the GeoGebra? Uh, so did they did they ask for this uh, analysis and are you providing the analysis to GeoGebra or, or was it your your own idea and your, your own motivation to to do this because of your uh, your experiences with GeoGebra? It was my own idea, yeah. 
Okay, but is GeoGebra going to to are they interested in it and do they want to to use it as as data for improving the? Um... Not as I know right now. I mean, I have already been talking to, for example, Julia, mm -hmm. but it is just my study now. Okay. So, but it will be so good that it, they will be super interested in the in the results and use it for improving GeoGebra, I guess. Maybe I can say some words about that. So, of course, we are interested. So, we're looking forward to also see the results of Susanne and, yeah, to maybe can improve some things when we get some feedback. It's always okay. great to get some feedback on the usage. Good. Thank you, Julia. Uh, any more uh, questions to Susanne? Uh, Nicola, please. Yeah, I, I would like to add something. Uh, hello. Uh, I was a very new user to GeoGebra, and I still cannot work very well with the platform. And I see that everyone can create their own uh, exercises there. Um, maybe it's also interesting uh, for the people that create exercises to know Prove their exercises because, from what I see, the platform is very capable of creating anything. Uh, but some sometimes uh, some of the exercises uh, just don't make a lot of sense if they are not didactic, didactically created. So they they can be followed by the students. So I, I had I had a couple of problems with with some of the of the apps. They have a lot of uh, you have a lot of opportunities to 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 play with it, but in the end, what do you get from it? This is the question. Yeah, the so. problem is that really everyone can make it, and if you or it is difficult to really search on what you want to know, and then you don't know if it is um, a good idea to use this applet. So it is. It, you're right. So as I as I don't do not know GeoGebra, as I'm not in this field, is there no such thing as these uh, stars uh, that you have in in uh, YouTube or something where you can find out if the video is good or not? So this doesn't exist in GeoGebra, or is it a number of user users that use this applet, or is there nothing? No, it is nothing like that. Ah, okay. So you so can find everything from everyone who made it, and you don't really know if it is good or not. Okay. So, so maybe you could ask uh, if if it would be helpful to to have a, a quality indication or if a user yeah rating, rating system maybe. yeah yeah that's good yeah yeah so cool now we invented something where we can we can go home that's you great know, yeah uh, thank you <laughs> solved all the issues of GeoGebra <laughs> yeah it's great. Uh, thanks, Nicola, for the for for the feedback and the, yeah, and thank the, you very much. Um, any other questions? No, then thanks a lot for for oh, oh Lisa? No, are you just waving at? Sorry, someone? it's okay. Oh. So well, now we have plenty of time, so I think we we can uh, discuss uh, a bit more. So it, perhaps if I show you all. Um, uh this uh didacti oh sorry uh this didactical model for uh, analyzing kind of conditions and, and constraints um and and just um i will just shortly share my screen uh here uh here if we look one of these pictures, if I can get it in, in big. Okay, so it didn't really become a lot bigger, but here you see kind of uh, nine levels mm -hmm. of putting conditions and constraints into. So you have the level of civilization, like a Western, so that's very broad, but that's kind of, we have computers everywhere. So we want to have the computers and technology in our classroom. So. So that's kind of that level. But if you also go um, into the discipline, so disciplines are mathematics and physics and chemistry, but then you have domain and so on and school and society. Um, it's just that I, I did a, a this kind of ecological analysis of how technology can exist or what are the conditions and constraints that is documented 
so far in the literature. Uh, so I was just thinking, Susanna, what would you say to this kind of leveling? Or is you more focused on, on technical specificities? So <laughs> what you think? Yeah, I, I think you can definitely have a look at a closer look at it. Yeah. So we, we, where would you anal uh, analysis range, do you think? Uh, oh, I, I don't know yet. No. <laughs> <laughs> OK, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the input, uh, Louise. Uh, yeah, any other, another quick question to Susanne would be possible because we have a bit of slack at the end of our session. Any more questions to Susanne? No, then uh, thanks a lot, Susanne, for the presentation and for uh, uh, thanks to everyone for the, the interesting questions that we had in the discussion. I think, uh, I think it was good. And uh, there were some good questions raised and some, some good points to, to, for all of us to, to consider. So thanks again, Susanne. And uh, Nicola, you would, be, you would be next with your presentation about Open uh, Geoboard. Mm, he just left, is that true? Oh. He was time. here just a second ago and then dropped out. So possible yeah, technical difficulties? I just think so, yeah. Yeah, let's let's wait for a few. Uh, let's wait a bit minutes. here. We don't have another one. So. Uh, we, have, we have plenty of time. It's, uh, Perhaps, good. Brian, you're the... No, we haven't heard much about you other than it's the middle of the night for you. <laughs> the question uh, would warm more be, are you still awake or do you sleep in between? I took uh, I took a little nap. Um, I took a couple naps okay. um, at various times in the day, knowing that I was going to need all the energy I could get. Um, I was up at three o'clock this morning, and it is now quarter to three again. Um, okay. Uh, and I've slept for three hours, so I'm I'm hanging in there. Uh, hopefully, I don't snap at my students today. <laughs> Just hold myself together and be very calm. Yes. <laughs> so, yeah, no, but it's a, it's a fun experience and you can endure anything for a time. And so it's, it's a pleasure to be here. I've heard some great, great lines of research and uh, some really neat topics that, that people are doing. And I, I wish I could hear more. There were like five different ones I wanted to hear and, and some were at the same time. And then, some I missed because the different breakout rooms aren't lined up in time anymore, because um, it just it just gets off a little bit toward the end. But yeah, yeah, you're right. I also have to. Uh, I'm also looking forward to to getting the video links to all the rooms because I also had the, the same impression that you had that I missed out on some uh, very interesting presentations because they occurred at the same time. So yeah, yeah uh, looking forward to to then viewing a lot of the other presentations. Uh, Nicola, hello again. Oh, yeah, sorry, I had some te technical difficulties. Yeah, that, that's what we thought, but uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, I needed to restart easy. Zoom, uh, so it works better. Um, so let me start my thing. So yeah, you are back. Then, uh, Nicola, floor is yours. Um, looking forward to your presentation about open uh, geoports. Thank you, just a second. Um, yeah, now I, okay, so, ah, there it is, okay. Do you see my presentation? Great. So uh, my name is Nikola Chernev. I'm from Bulgaria and I'm a maker. Uh, and today I want to present you my learning material, wooden learning material, Open Geoboard. Um, I called it Open Geoboard because uh, it's made as an open design process. Um, right. Uh, I'll tell you very fast uh, my, my story. Um, 
you you all know the geo boards so that are here for like 50 years uh like these are the plastic ones do you see my also my pointer yes yeah. we can so see these it. are the plastic ones almost in every school or kindergarten wooden ones and i have experience uh, with montessori kindergartens because my kids go to montessori kindergartens and there i got the um, inspiration of the wooden geo board and i want to create one for home uh, and this is the first one i did with my, from an old wooden uh, chopstick and then i in a fab lab i started tinkering and i I created further and further, then I created some templates out of uh, cardboard. You will see how we use them uh, with the laser cutter. Then, um, then I saw, uh, because I bought some uh, long packs, in the beginning I, I said, okay, why not use it in three-dimensional space? And then uh, there were some problems because the rubber bands were sliding down. Then I tried with these small uh, O-rings, um, then I created these ones. Now work pretty well uh, in three-dimensional space. Then I started some small production batches, and uh, at the Maker Fair 2015, I presented the first version of the geo board. Um, and a lot of kids went there uh, and played with it. So, um, I saw a lot of potential in the in the platform. Um, and uh, now I'm working on, on this project uh, and I want to create a learning material, which is for children from kindergarten up to the 12th grade. Uh, there are uh, a lot of exercises that you board and can help kids uh, learn better maths and, and geometric and also algebra. Uh, so here are some examples of things you can do on GeoBoards. You can see the two, the Cartesian coordinate system on the left. These are actually two coordinate systems uh, to put together. The outer one is 12 by 12 and the inner one is 11, which give a lot of flexibility of, um, of the platform. Then you can, you can stack the, uh, the, the boards uh, 90 degrees to each other we can create a lot of um, a lot of art <laughs> for kids like they can play uh, so this is one you see here template five by five so the idea is that when you when you have the board uh, it has 265 uh, openings and it's very difficult for smaller younger children to to start with it working with it and then we fix this problem by using these templates. You put them up, and you can you can change the you can change the usability of the geoboard. Uh, you can you can also connect the geoboards and make one big uh, bigger um, playing surface. So this is a, this is a labyrinth uh, with a maze with with a with a bow. Can even create uh, mazes on on the on the board and other games. Which is this is also mathematics, so you can present it as a mathematical exercise. So here are some of the most difficult things I have created uh, so far. Um, these two things, which are actually um, maybe you know the the um, the formulas behind them. They are pretty complicated and complex. Uh, but when you make it on a geo board, even eight year old kids can do it and can understand this uh, parabolic uh, um, art things. Uh, create art, which is which is amazing without looking at anything. They just play with their hands and you can you can see art like this. So here are some of the templates we have. Uh, for the Cartesian uh, coordinate system. Uh, I have created even uh, templates for the Ludo game, which work pretty well on, on the platform. So this is uh, the dot paper version, which you already may know. Um, and I'm, uh, I'm using these uh, templates um, on paper next to the geo board. Cartesian, polar, and isometric coordinate systems. Um, 
So the idea is when you don't have the geo board, for instance, like now, uh, like when, when kids are uh, learning from home, they can use the thought, thought paper for, for exercising. Uh, here are some apps um, that are out there. Uh, has, uh, as you also spoke with Susanna before, has uh, maybe around 20 different geo board uh, apps made from different by, by different people. Uh, so this is one of the most known from the math learning center. It's very um, simple, and this is an app also from uh, an iPad app. So the thing is that they're all 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 of them are two dimensional. And uh, my idea is that I would like to create a three-dimensional uh, app, uh, maybe in GeoGebra. It should be possible, um, but as I said, I don't have a lot of experience now and I'm working on it. And I'm trying, I'm starting to try some things. So I'm looking for, for people that are interested in working with me on a three-dimensional GeoBoard app uh, in GeoGebra. So, um, yeah, I'm. I was invited by uh, Professor Zot um, to to show you the geo board um, and maybe find someone <laughs> someone who does research in this direction um, and is interested in geo boards and um, learning materials, math manipulatives. So I have these three, uh, the first three points that I'm working on at the moment two ones so testing the geo board in schools and kindergartens i already have some experience but it would be really nice if i have some real researcher behind behind the project so it's really we can really um really check the quality and quantitatively and qualitatively how how good the geo board in the classroom is and of course, also um, to see how good the exercises are and which exercises make sense and which don't make sense. Uh, we, I, I have worked with a couple of math teachers in their free time um, and we have found a lot of, um, they're already in the math uh, learning books, teacher's books that can be that can be shown on the geo board, uh, but now the question is, of course, how can we visualize it on the geo board, and how how can we create our own um, exercise book, uh, teachers books for the open geo board? Uh, so the, the third point is also that, um, as I said, I want to create a three D geo board app. And uh, as a bonus, because it's an open design project. Uh, it can be done by anyone, anywhere. Um, also looking for uh, teachers in schools where there are fab labs or wooden workshops uh, to, to just work uh, with kids and create their own geoboards, which I already have uh, tried a couple of times and it works pretty well, even with like seven, eight year old kids. Nicola, um, apologies. I forgot the three minute call. Uh, you have one minute left. Yeah, uh, this is more or less. Yeah, this is more or less my whole presentation. Uh, I can <laughs> I can talk hours about it. There are so many things, but I, I hope you got the the main idea about how it, is, how it looks like and what what its potential is. And um, yeah, um, looking forward to your questions and uh, ideas of how, how it can be developed further. Thank you, Nicola. Uh, it was really, really interesting to, uh, to see this uh, quite, quite simple but hands-on way to, to teach uh, uh, geometric, uh, geometric uh, things to, to kids. And they are probably there are, there are some researchers interested. I think it would be an, an interesting way to, um, to research uh, the understanding of the of the kids with this um, questions on the floor. Brian, was this a, a hand raise? Yes. So please, Brian, <laughs> go ahead. Oh, sir, first of all, your the the boards that you uh, have developed are are beautiful. Well done. Um, I thank you very I much. Know just enough about woodworking to be impressed, and not enough to be able to replicate it. Um, um, so I work at a school that is also a fab lab. And so I'm always looking for um, 
projects that students could work on that have mathematical components, mathematical representations, mm -hmm. um, having heavy calculation needs. Um, and so on your, on your bonus number four, I'm not a researcher yet, like working on that, but I, I'm not going to be able to help you in, in that area. But uh, I would love to talk more about how you work with kids on the creation process, what kind of uh, mathematical thought and, and procedure goes into the fabrication process. Um, and in, 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 in doing that, we'll probably run across things, uh, activities and stuff that high school students could get out of something that has historically lived very much in a K3 kind of uh, kind of environment, but you've exactly. definitely taken it to the next level. Yeah, so th this, is, this is my uh, observation of those kids when, when they use these plastic ones and even the, the wooden ones, but like the, the, the geo boards. I, I actually, um, I, will, I will show you one of the main differences. Um, so here uh, in the plastic ones and the, the, the standard wooden ones, all the dots are already already so this means that the, the kids work uh, directly and only with the lines while building things and this is why they get bored pretty pretty fast and there there is a there's not a really open-ended play and open-ended learning possible on them and as an open geo board uh, you don't have the dots first you, you need to you need first find find out where the dots are in space. Then you need to find them in three-dimensional space, and then you start building the lines. So this makes uh, a lot more uh, possibilities, skits, for really for open-ended learning and open-ended play. Um, and and, and, the, two, uh, and the, the due part really grows with the kids. I, I have two kids. One is now in kindergarten, one is in the fourth grade. So like you can start from kindergarten up to at least in Bulgaria, there's a lot of things that you can present on the geo board. And as I showed you, there are so many things that can be done also in high school. Uh, about the making of the geo board, so there were some photos of it. So, so this is like making with a CNC router. Uh, of course, you just show the kids use a CNC router. Uh, you you upload the cut cut files and then the machine makes it. Um, but the thing that you can do by hand is, for instance, this thing. This is with a press drill. Mm -hmm. So you put uh, you you show the kids like this is also between paper and film. You start you start on the computer. You create this grid. Then you print it out. Then you show you you can show them scale, for instance, because if you if you don't print out the, the grid one on one in the printer, then it won't fit the piece of board. Then you can show them the difference between digital scaling. It doesn't matter how big it's on the screen. It's important that the settings are right. So that one centimeter on the screen is one centimeter in real life when you print it out and so on. So just, just a small ex example. And then they just need to, to follow the dots and uh, make some holes and then you buy this pen. You can find them anywhere, uh, I guess, uh, in different sizes. Like we have even one meter long here and we can cut them in different, uh, in different lengths. And then you have it. So it's a, it's a typical woodworking project. It doesn't need to be made in a fab lab. And then of course, kids can start playing with it right away. Yeah, that's uh, that's awesome. Those are some great ideas. And yeah, and with the laser, you can create with the kids even their own templates. You can put on top. I've been playing with lasers for the last few years. I've only been yeah. playing with our CNC router for the last three weeks. Um, so I'm, okay. I'm brand new at uh, CNC router work, but it's been a lot of fun. Yeah, it's it's not uh, very different <laughs> actually. Yeah. Yeah, but but maybe that's interesting. Sorry to interrupt your uh, <laughs> discussion, uh, Brian. Maybe it's uh, it's also interesting way of uh, of teaching the your secondary school kids how to how does a, a CNC uh, 
interesting uh, work. How do you program it? What is the background yes. of, uh, of, so it, it could be a programming lesson thing, uh, sure. understanding CNC. So, so it's, yeah. there could be uh, also thing. something else we, we already did. It's right with some kids. Uh, I think they were like third or fourth grade maximum. Uh, a friend of mine had a small um, fab lab in a school in a rural school actually, so where kids saw a 3D printer for the first time. And he used the geo boards with the different sides, uh, different lengths of the packs to show them how the 3D. I needed more time for discussion. Should we, we were have... in the middle of the discussion. Oh, should, yes. we, should we, we add, add some time?